Good evening, and welcome to Meet the Scientists. Thank you for joining us again this evening. This is our one-year anniversary for Meet the Scientists. We're thrilled to be here again. We had a little hiatus last month, and i um, excited to have Dr. Leela Schlenker with us tonight. Um, I want to let you know that we will be continuing Meet the Scientists in January. Um, we do have the Outer Banks field site is, um, we'll be presenting in December, so that will be one of our um, virtual seminars taking place in December. We will go back to Meet the Scientist in January, January 20th, so please join us. So again, we're thrilled to have Dr. Leela Schlenker, sorry, <laughs> Schlenker, with us this evening. Um, and, and Dr. Schlenker is a postdoc fellow, postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Morley's lab. And we met with Dr. Morley, I don't recall how long ago, but a few months ago. Um, and I am excited about this opportunity to talk to you after I've learned about some of your, your experiences from education to technician. And I just want to give you sort of an opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about how you got to where you are here at the Coastal Studies Institute. Um, and I might delve into it a little bit more because I think it's a really exciting way that you got to where you are. And what I think is really exciting about it is you sort of tested the waters as you went along and yeah. really figured out what you liked and maybe what you didn't like. And I think yep. that's one of the things I really like talking about in this programming because um, for those that are younger in our audience, they can really learn a lot about our experiences and how we found our trajectory. So that was a lot of words for saying welcome to the hot seat tonight and maybe just give a little bit about yourself and how you joined us here. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll start, I guess, with kind of like the big picture of what brought me into this field. Is that? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I, gr I grew up in a really small town, so I did definitely spend a lot of time outdoors just kind of enjoying nature, fishing, hiking, camping, that kind of thing. So along the coast? <clears throat> no, this was in uh, New Hampshire, not on the coast. Not on the um, coast. Yeah, but we always went to Maine, you know, for a week or so in the summer. And so definitely that was like, I, I knew the ocean and I loved the ocean, um, but it wasn't, definitely did not see myself as a marine scientist in any way, shape or right. form right. <laughs> growing up. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something with the environment, so I went to um, I went to Smith College um, and didn't really know what I wanted to do there. But I had a really great professor who encouraged me to try out biology, so um, I gave that a try. And then um, my junior year, I studied away from campus at the Williams Mystic program, which it's a interdisciplinary maritime studies semester that's like very hands-on learning. Is it at the aquarium? So it's, it's a partnership between Williams College and the Mystic Seaport. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's like 20 students, usually juniors, okay. and you, you take a bunch of just maritime focused courses. Um, so Did I got- you sail off? Yeah, for okay. about 10 days um, on a tall ship. Yep. So that was pretty, that was, you know, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. But really what uh, kind of got my attention from that semester was, uh, it, independent study project that we had to design for our marine ecology class. Um, and a friend of mine and I, we decided we wanted to learn more about commercial fishing. So we went down to the docks in Stonington, Connecticut, which is one of the last remaining kind of commercial trawl fleets in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, found somebody who would let us go out on their boat with them. Um, and, and actually speak to you about what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And this is, uh, has well, for a lot of my career, this has been kind of a theme where just find people that are willing to let me go out on their right, boats right, yeah. and do science. Um, so we ended up just taking like diet samples, so like stomach contents from a bunch of different fish. And that in itself wasn't really, you know, necessarily the thing that sparked my interest, but being... <laughs> it, it wasn't gut content. No, okay. no. I mean, that was fun. But right. um, uh, just like being out on the boat and seeing all of these fish that were coming up in the trawl and marine organisms, you know, stuff that I'd never seen before and also talking to these fishermen about their knowledge and their history in the fishery and just kind of information that they almost took for granted because it was just something they'd been doing for so long. Um, mm. Both of those kind of experiences really um, just kind of, it was like a light bulb moment, I guess, where I was like, right. if this is a job, I think this is a job that I, I want. I could do this, yeah. I could do this. Yeah. yeah. And so then you sort of went back to Smith and finished. Yep. And biology. so, yeah, biology. And from then I just kind of was like, 
any little like internship um, position or experience that seemed like it was related to fish, I would grab it. Um, right. And I had d definitely the good fortune to have most of those be like paid internships or things, so I could actually, you yeah. know. I mean, because I mean, there are a lot of biology graduates, mm -hmm. and so you know, figuring out and navigating that coming out of a biology degree. I mean, you had a lot of really interesting experiences out of your bachelor's. And as you mentioned, these internships, the Smithsonian, yep. you worked at Dauphin Island, Sea Lab, yep. um, NOAA, right? So you yeah. did a lot of different <clears throat> things, um, all fisheries focused? Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, so I guess the first thing I did was was sort of based on restoration. So out in Seattle looking at like, what happens to salmon and trout when we take out a dam that had been there for a hundred years and looking mm -hmm. at how these fish would move in response to that dam being removed. So that was kind of my first experience and I learned how to uh, fly fish a little bit and uh, yeah, identify bugs under the microscope right. to look at what salmon were eating. Yeah, when I sort of <laughs> look at your career path, I mean, you've worked from, we'll talk about shrimp here in a little bit, yeah. but from shrimp to white marlin. Yeah. Right, I mean, <laughs> across the spectrum. And there, there is a story there, actually, I think. I mean, maybe it's easier now in retrospect to kind of like say- Find the, the connection? Yeah, but huh. I think like as a you know, recent graduate, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know that grad school was an option or even something that wasn't something that I had really learned in school. So it was really just doing these internship technician positions, oh, getting exposed to a is lot of different... Is it because you came from, a, from Smith College, which is a small woman's college, right, mm -hmm. liberal arts? Yeah. So do you think it was because you just didn't have, you weren't exposed to it? Yeah, I guess I just, I think also, um, I think this is a positive thing in my opinion. Like growing up, my parents didn't really like push us towards like, you know, they wanted us to go path, to college, right. but it wasn't like you have to keep, you know, right. and doing any one thing, just figure out what you want to do and... Yeah. Um, and so I kind of, I guess I've, I've been quite lucky to have a lot of really excellent mentors, but I just kept kind of following experiences that I found that I enjoyed. Right. And I would ask, you know, ask people that I was working with, like, you know, what should I do next? How do I, how do I get ahead in this field? What do I do? Um, so it's really just been a process of kind of following what I loved and what I found important in terms of protecting fish species and mm -hmm. also, you know, understanding that fisheries are, are vitally important to our kind of history and economy. So that's something, you know, I think we can balance both of those things. Right. Um, but yeah, that's been something that's just kind of driven me from kind of place to place and job to job and degree to degree. Right. Cause, so you went from these different <laughs> internships, did a master's at VIMS, mm -hmm. working on White, White Marlin. Marlin. Yep. Right? <clears throat> and then from there again, you were like, oh, this is good. I'll go work, and you were a technician for a little bit, and yep. then made the decision to go and do a PhD. Yeah. And did your PhD at University of Miami, and I won't hold that against you, but Florida <laughs> State did beat Miami this past weekend, just to throw it out there. That's news to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody. Um, anyway, and so, so you did your PhD, and so your PhD research is actually pretty interesting. This is right around Deepwater Horizon. Right. Yeah. So I I started my PhD in 2015. Um, I had I had just I'd been working in the Everglades actually, which for just for a year. But that was that was a fun experience, um, getting to kind of see a really different ecosystem. And right. um, but I was kind of like I want to I want to work on pelagic fishes. I want to work on highly migratory species. So that brought me to the University you didn't of like Miami. like mangroves and the. I do. I, okay. I I I. Well, to be honest, it was one of those jobs where. Um, I knew it wasn't going to be my favorite thing to be <laughs> wading around in chest deep water with alligators. Uh -huh, but sure. that was one thing where I was like, this is going to be a new experience. I'm going to learn some new stuff. I'm right. just going to be trying not to think about the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was great. And I met some you know, wonderful people and learned a lot. Right. Um, and it definitely sort of, yeah, encouraged me to go back to school to kind of do what it was that I was the most excited about. And so you got back to your pelagic <laughs> fish. And yeah. I, anyway, I want to, although I want to talk about your PhD research for a little bit because I find it fascinating for multiple reasons, and I think it's very relevant to the fishery here on the Outer Banks as well. And so you did a lot of work. Well, I mean, I guess you worked on damselfish as well, but what I want to sort of speak to is the work that you did with mahi mahi, mm -hmm. um, because it's really interesting and and 
part of it is I, I was excited that the way you go about your collection, at least what I saw, was basically by reel, yeah. line yeah. and reel, right? And so you collect fish <clears throat> by fishing for them. Yeah, so we, um, most of my PhD research, well, pretty much all of it was focused on looking at the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, and a lot of that work was laboratory based and one of the things that kind of came out of the spill because it was so far offshore, which was kind of unique um, for, you know, set it apart from spills that had happened in the past, right. there was a real need to understand what happened to pelagic fishes. So open ocean, mm -hmm. you know, tunas, marlin, mahi-mahi. Um, and mahi-mahi are one of the, sort of one of the, those pelagic fishes that you can actually rear in a hatchery setting. So at the University of Miami, um, they have a really excellent uh, experimental aquaculture facility that can keep those fish in captivity. So some of the work that I did was laboratory based with them um, using mm. those aquaculture reared mahi-mahi. So you can rear them actually in the lab. Yeah, and it's not easy. It's, it's, they have a bunch of very skilled people there um, that have perfected kind of the technique and kind of all the care and work that goes into that. Mm -hmm. But you know, that kind of partnership with them, we were able to do a lot of physiology work in the lab to look at how crude oil impacts things like their olfaction, their sense of smell, their behavior. Um, but then also, yeah, we do, uh, we do work with the wild fish. Uh, so I was able to, I was really interested in looking at how wild fish would behave after crude oil exposure because that was, believe it or not, that's like one of the things that we have just kind of started to crack the surface on is what actually happens in the wild after fish have been exposed to oil. And so my guess is you can set up some lab experiments to look at that as well, but actually yep. getting some of these fish that were exposed or getting the fish from the wild, exposing them and putting them back out. Yep. So both. yeah, both. And the, <laughs> the issue with there's, there's been some really great studies that have, you know, s surveyed fish in the wild and, and you can do things like take, um, bile samples and look at and see that, okay, this fish has been exposed to PAHs, but, um, you can't really tell how much, um, and you don't really know, you know, what impact has that had other than, okay, this fish did get exposed and it's still alive. Um, right. so I was really interested in using electronic tags to, um, basically look at how fish behave in the wild after, after they have been exposed to oil. Um, especially, you know, kind of in comparison to like a known control group and, and basically looking at how they behave and migrate um, in response to fish that haven't been exposed and also uh, understand more about their reproduction, how that's impacted to kind of get a better sense of how this might, um, you know, continue down the road for the whole population. Right. <clears throat> so I, one of the things I was surprised at was the size of these tags mm -hmm. compared to the size of the fish. Yep. And so have... Have there been studies, my guess is that wasn't the focus of your study is what the tag necessarily does, but in captivity, were you able to sort of get a sense for changes in the fish when you add a tag? I mean, do they act differently when you put a tag like this on them? That's a really good question. So we, um, I was able to do a couple of lab-based studies because I, was, I really wanted to look at the acceleration data from the tags to mm -hmm. see if I could identify spawning. And because the, the fish um, will spawn or reproduce in captivity, at, you know, in this experimental hatchery, um, I was able to, you know, tag them in captivity and, and look at those behavior patterns around spawning or reproduction mm -hmm. and kind of take that information um, to apply to the wild fish. So uh, one of the things we could do with that is, is, you know, observe these fish after they're tagged, make right. sure that they're, you know, they're swimming normally, that they're feeding. Um, and we also did a study, this was a um, master's student at the time, now a PhD student at the University of Miami, did a study where he directly kind of tested that out and huh. compared the behavior, the feeding, and the swimming performance of tagged and untagged fish. So we were able to find yeah. out, we yeah. were able to find out that their um, kind of free swimming behavior is not impacted by tagging. And so that was a really important study to right. kind of say, okay, we can, we can tag these fish in the wild and, you know, take that data for what it is and not have to worry that this is, right. you know, they should be acting behavior. like they would be otherwise. Yep. And these tags collect temperature, salinity, depth? No salinity no sal data. Temperature, um, temperature depth. depth, and then light data, which you can use to estimate kind of like 
their track or their, their location. Okay. Um, and we can also now integrate these accelerometers and that's how I've, I've estimated spawning location. Because they change, they, they change their speed when they spawn. Yeah, they, spawn. D they do this um, pretty interesting, they, so first of all, they spawn in the middle of the night. So um, typically between midnight and about 5 a.m., which meant as a graduate student, I was staying up all night, <laughs> sitting out at this hatchery um, in the dark by myself, usually, <laughs> with my beach chair kind of set up next to the tank, um, just waiting. 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 Yes. And then, uh, you know, so if they spawned at 2 a.m., I would, you know, okay, it's 2 a.m. and they're spawning, <laughs> and then I could go home and sleep. Um, but that was... You gotta love grad school. Yeah. So <laughs> I always tell students sometimes that it's like, this is, in the end, we got a really exciting study, some really exciting data out of it, but, you know, always keep in mind... Um, you know, what's going yeah, data on collection the can seats. be challenging at times. It can be. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things that I, I thought was interesting, and and again, sort of understanding your history and, and, and some of your research is there are there are two terms that you use for I think what what your research focuses on, and I just want to see if you can sort of elaborate on these two. Okay. So one is movement ecology, and mm -hmm. the other was sensory physiology. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like both of those terms, but you know, when I just sort of think of them quickly, I'm like, uh, you know, it makes sense of what it, what, both words make sense to me, movement ecology. But when I put them together and think about your research, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more what that means sure. from a research perspective. Yeah. So. Um, in the laboratory during my PhD, I used this technique called the electro-olfactogram technique, which is a lot Not of... Not familiar. Yeah, <laughs> most people aren't. It's actually, it's, it's kind of an older technique, but it huh. basically, um, you know, the simple explanation is that you can measure what a fish or another animal can smell. Um, and so this is really important because we know that fish use their sense of smell for things like migration, for finding habitat, for finding mates, um, kind of for some species, you know, it varies by the species how important each sense is, but olfaction is one of those that's really important for a lot of, a lot of marine organisms. Mm -hmm. And so in particular, I was looking at how things like crude oil can affect sense of smell. Um, and in the bicolored damselfish, I found out that it does impact their ability to detect this really important alarm cue that they use to evade predators. Um, so that helps. That's one way that we can kind of understand um, more about how these fish will move in the wild in response to crude oil. So that's like you can pair the sensory information to say if these damselfish are exposed to crude oil, they're not going to detect this alarm cue, which means when a predator comes, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to avoid that predator. Right. They're not going to swim away. So for me, I use sensory physiology as a way to kind of um, understand animal movements in terms of if we can understand what a marine organism can detect, we'll understand more about how they react and respond to environmental change. And so I, I guess sort of to bring this around um, from, the, from your PhD work and, and working with the mahi-mahi is, you know, what, <clears throat> what do you think you can, you can use from your work to help us better understand or, you know, better deal with the next bill? Because there certainly will be another one at some yeah. point, right? And so from your research, how does that help steer us in the right direction for the next potential spill? Yeah, I mean, it's really important to understand exactly, you know, some of these, some of the impacts that will occur from oil exposure and in particular things like what actually was measured in the Gulf of Mexico during that particular spill. Oh, so, right. you know, it's, it's not a surprise to anyone that crude oil is bad for marine animals, you know, that's, that's sure. not novel. <laughs> um, but it's, so it is important to understand that, you know, kind of these small or low concentrations and brief exposures that might happen in the wild, what kind of impacts we can see. So um, one of the last projects that I did in Miami was this large scale cruise. We went into the Gulf of Mexico. We caught a lot of mahi-mahi. Um, we put them in tanks. Some of them were control fish, some of them got an oil exposure treatment, just like in the lab. And then we tagged them with these electronic tags and let them go back into the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and that was you know, a really important study, I think, because we really need to understand how in the natural environment, when there's predators, when there's changes in temperature and, and dissolved oxygen, these different stressors that fish have to do, have to deal with, like how does that crude oil then 
um, impact their ability to kind of survive in that environment. So one of the things that I found in that study was that the oil exposed fish, we tracked them for out to 37 days and we didn't see any spawning behavior in those fish for that entire time. And so that's something that in the laboratory is a little bit harder to measure because, you know, we ha in, in the lab setting, you know, you're typically keeping your animals in constant temperatures, right. there's no Pretty predators, sure. all these things. So it's harder to get the full picture. Right. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is sort of the, <clears throat> in thinking about and, and what has been studied in the way of oil spills, a lot of that has been focused on along the coast, right? It's those things yep. that you do see and you see often. Um, and the fact is, is there might be long-term impacts in those fish that we don't see very right. often and sort of the ecology of the deeper ocean that we yep. aren't necessarily considering or certainly it's not as obvious to us. And right. So thinking beyond that, I think some of that work really does show that. Um, so let's move a little closer to home because okay. um, obviously you're doing a lot of work in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and you know a lot of that is focused and, and pretty interestingly is focused on how climate has maybe an influence or an impact or changes a fishery. And so maybe just sort of speak to your current work. Sure. So what brought me here, I guess, was actually, it doesn't seem related, but the, the Mahi Mahi work in Miami, one of the things that I found was that um, as these, you know, Mahi are migrating, they, they migrate a hundred kilometers a day in some cases. So they're really, you know, they're really energetic, athletic swimmers. Um, but they are really good at controlling their temperature. So they'll, they'll migrate north, of course, you know, at, when it's hot down south, um, but they also really finely control their depth to stay in a really narrow temperature window. So they're not control, they're controlling the temperature <clears throat> in which they're swimming. Yes, They yes. can really, yeah, so and, and either, just within a small window. Yeah, so <laughs> if it's, you know, like, so for, for example, down in South Florida in the summertime, it is really hot at it's the hot. surface of the water. <laughs> so the fish are not at the surface of the water, they're down deeper. Um, and they're really good at kind of, huh. you know, controlling either their depth or their, you know, latitude moving up and down the coast um, to really stay in just about like a degree or two of temperature variation. So that, of course, has big implications for climate change. And that's what kind of got me really interested in Jim Morley's work um, because he's done so much work looking at, you know, climate change and how that's going to impact fisheries distributions. So um, that's part of our project with the shrimp here is understanding how climate change and also just, um, you know, regular kind of environmental variation like things like precipitation um, can impact the shrimp in Pamlico Sound. So the work that you're doing here is focused in Pamlico Sound. Yes. And you're using basically a long-term data set that has been collected by the state? Yep, it's from um, North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries, and it goes back, um, well, the main data set goes back to 1987. I'll do the math quickly, so <laughs> about, about 30 years or so. Yep. Um, and, and so you can use that data and with an understanding of how temperature or climate is changing within Pamlico Sound. And so I guess, Where's your climate data coming from, and, and do we have good long-term records of, of those variables that are of interest to you within Pamlico Sound or around? So, yeah, one of the things that's been interesting about this project is discovering some of those long-term environmental data sets that are publicly available, actually. Mm -hmm. So... Um, some of the data that I'm using is collected by the survey itself. So they, you know, they'll take temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen measurements when they go out and they sample for shrimp. Um, but a lot of it is coming from uh, NOAA buoys located kind of in close proximity to Pamlico Sound. Okay. And then um, also USGS stream gauges as kind of a proxy of, of precipitation. So how much water is flowing through some All of right. these creeks and rivers that are feeding into Pamlico Sound. Um, and then I'm also using things like the um, North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which, you know, sort of is a metric of, of pressure um, and, you know, how stormy it's or... Large scale yeah. changes. Um, <clears throat> so actually, so you said stormy, sorry, to, I just sort of coming from that end. Is, are you also looking at some of those small scale implications? Like, so when we are, when we have major storms versus periods of times where we don't, or is it really sort of looking at that 
dis, you know, maybe decadal scale shifts? It's both because one thing that's interesting about shrimp is that they have this life cycle where they do everything in about a year, but the, you know, the adults are in ocean waters reproducing and then the larval shrimp have to get up into the tidal creeks of Pamlico Sound. They grow really fast and they move into the deeper areas of Pamlico Sound. Mm, um, relatively deeper. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, still quite shallow. Right, yeah. um, but so they kind of have this, within a year, they have this life cycle where they're actually moving quite a bit. Um, mm. And so there are these sort of larger climate forces that might impact their success or failure, um, as well as really like, you know, fine scale things like how hot or cold a particular creek might be. Huh. And so I guess, you know, from 30,000 feet, give us, you know, sort of some <clears throat> idea of what your research is showing. Yeah. So I've focused on the three commercially important species. So that's brown, white, and pink. Um, white shrimp have really increased here in Pamlico Sound in, in the last like five or 10 years. Um, Pink shrimp have sort of been on this long-term decline, and brown shrimp um, have varied quite a bit. And in general, sort of the like trademark of shrimp here in Pamlico Sound is that it varies a huge amount from year to year how many shrimp there are. And so, you know, our hypotheses were basically that we think that the environmental variables are driving a lot of this variation. Um, and the work that I've done so far has shown that that is really true, much more so than a lot of um, other systems or organisms that I've worked with. Right. Like for example, we can explain with the white shrimp, we can explain 75% of the variation in the data just using environmental variables. Which so <clears throat> speak to what maybe you were getting ready to. What are some of those environmental variables? Yeah, so for white shrimp, um, winter temperature is huge and um, how many uh, adults are out on the shelf spawning actually. So when we have warmer winters here, there's a really nice correlation between winter temperature. Um, warmer winter temperature means more adults on the shelf spawning, and that means a lot more shrimp in huh. Pamlico Sound the next fall. Um, huh. So you almost predict it. Yeah, and that's part of the idea is that when we have these relationships, we can sort of understand how future changes might impact these different species. So could you actually use that as a, a tool for, hmm, I mean, Raise this the way I would. So could you use that to help in, in managing a fishery? Yeah, so it'll help us certainly um, understand sort of on the short time scale of yeah. using kind of um, one of the things that I found with, with brown shrimp, we have both a juvenile index and an adult index that the state collects. Um, and I found, which again, not terribly surprisingly, but the juvenile index is a great predictor for how many shrimp we then have in the summer for brown shrimp. Right. So that's, that's helpful on, on the sort of short-term scale of, of knowing that, okay, we can take this metric that we have from April and get a better understanding of how many shrimp people will be catching in June or July, August um, for right. brown shrimp. So, that's, so on the small scale, you can almost, you know, I mean, the fact that you, could, you have almost all your, 70% of your variation based on a few variables is incredible, I think, in the environment, right? Yeah. I mean, we um, usually do not see that in biology. So it, right. it gives you some sense of just like how tightly correlated these shrimp are with kind of what's going on in the environment. Yeah, particularly if, <laughs> if, if that is tightly coupled with temperature. So this gets mm -hmm. into, my guess, some of the bigger questions that you're asking, you know, on average, global ocean temperatures have increased by more than one degree, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a huge shift for the ocean. Um, when you start looking more locally, some of those shifts are even greater. And so when we think about climate change, warming temperatures, what does that mean? And you know, some of the work that you're bringing into this, what is it showing? Yeah, um, and we actually know, you know from, from this data collected by the state also that Pamlico Sound has warmed you know, almost maybe more than a degree um, just in the last 30 years or so. Yeah, wow. um, so we know that white shrimp are gonna probably continue to become a larger portion of the catch here. Um, and brown shrimp, one of the things that I found in, in my data is that um, they're really sensitive to precipitation. So more rain means fewer brown shrimp. Um, and so that's an interesting variable with climate because we know that in general, sea level rise is gonna make Pamlico Sound saltier. 
um, but also that there's going to be more frequent storms likely so that when we do have large amounts of rain, um, we can expect fewer brown shrimp. And so from the perspective of thinking about just Pamlico Sound or, you know, sort of the local fishery, um, some of these changes in temperature, changes in storms will drive changes in the variation of these three species. You know, thinking about how we navigate that moving forward from, um, you know, for, for many of our fishermen, I mean, are, are there ways that we should steer some of the management um, based on, or, you know, how can some of the work that you're doing be used, I guess, for DMF and others to move forward? Yeah, I think I think when um, these results are finalized, we will be able to say generally, you know, when we'll do some amount of forecasting to say, gotcha. you know, when we get, you know, if we expect warmer temperatures, you know, this is the trend, and we expect more rain, this will be the trend with these species. And even um, one of the things that'll be a bit trickier, I think, is I found that for all three species, pink, white, and brown. Um, the wind speed and direction during the time when the adult shrimp are spawning or reproducing, that plays a big role. In, in recruitment. Yeah. So we know that that's, you know, a large part of how they end up into Pamlico Sound is just right. the right the right amount of wind in the right direction will really drive those, you know, larval that's shrimp interesting. into, so really into a, Pamlico Sound. A lot of different environmental variables could really yep. play into how the fishery responds. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, projections of temperature, you know, pretty well defined. I think we, we probably low, know less about the changes in wind speeds, wind directions, yep. how that might shift moving forward. And so still, I guess, a lot of work to be done. Thinking broader then, you know, the idea of climate, the idea of, of these species moving um, north, south, based on changes in climate. I mean, so, you know, again, from a broader perspective, how do we, how do we, how do we, from a management perspective, how do we navigate some of this? The idea of, of, you know, these fisheries have been managed, not necessarily locally, but you know, as they, sh you know, they're likely to shift more to the north. You know, how, how do we navigate that as North Carolina versus Virginia mm -hmm. and on up? Yeah, we know that, so for example, Virginia has opened a white shrimp fishery for the first time um, because the white shrimp are moving north, moving north. Um, and we we I think we know now that that is based on temperature warming and so um, it's also impacted our North Carolina fishermen because a lot of them are know that these white shrimp are going to be leaving Chesapeake Bay um, and so I've anecdotally heard I guess that many of them are kind of camping out on the state line waiting, waiting. for these white <laughs> shrimp to really like start you know flowing out of Chesapeake Bay. Um, so that kind of impacts the way our fishery operates. And right. there's also, I think, um, a lot of fishermen are saying that the, you know, the timing for when they're catching fish in the areas is, is shifting. So they might be spending more time on, out in the ocean rather than in Pamlico Sound. Oh, interesting. Um, so it really does impact the way the whole fishery operates. Right. And I like that, you know, the fact is there's so much that we can we can learn from the fishermen themselves, mm -hmm. right? The data that we're collecting is certainly critical, but also the experience and what they're actually finding, I, I mean, that's yeah. really important. And that's actually another interesting part of our study is that we have, we're partnering um, with Nadine Heck and her graduate student, Sam Farquhar, who's, they're doing a survey of fishermen to, mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of what sh uh, shrimp fishermen think is going on in the fishery. So we're hoping to be you know, be able to compare kind of results and oh, say, yeah. we have, you know, quantitative models from, from this, you know, data from DMF, and then we also have sort of Fisher's opinions on what's going on. Wow, that's really <clears throat> interesting. Bringing those two together will be really a really nice data set. Um, I want to remind people that you can certainly put questions in the chat, and we'll get to those in just a few minutes. I just have a couple more questions, and then we'll get to a couple of the questions in, in the chat. I, one of the things, and so, You've published several papers um, and, and given many presentations. One of those recently run, won an award at ECU for audience favorite. Yeah, that, that right? was the uh, postdoc, postdoc flash talk competition. So that was explain your research in three minutes. In three minutes, yes. And, and yours was about, what? anyway, one of the things <laughs> I wanted to bring up is the idea that how we present some of our science, right? I think it's really important that we do present our science, right? We need to get our data, our science out there. And I, I've, I was sort of taken by some of the ways that you present your science to make it more 
maybe more accessible, right? So a couple titles, you know, Damsels in Distress, which was speaking to damsels, damselfish. Mm -hmm. um, another one was referring to, what was it? What, a big fracking problem, mm -hmm. which was speaking to oil and fracking offshore. Yep. Right, so, um, and then the shrimp, Cocktail. Yeah. What's in your shrimp cocktail or something today? Yeah. What does what does climate have to do with your shrimp, shrimp cocktail? cocktail yeah. I think. So I, yeah. I mean, I love the way you sort of use these to make science more accessible, and and I'm curious. I mean, is that something you're doing purposefully? Is it? Do you? You know, is this just you know how you are? You know, <laughs> sort of playful with your science. What? I, I was curious. I, I, I really like it. I think it does make it more accessible, but I just wanted to get your opinion on it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, first, I do love a good pun. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I do have to give, actually, Sean credit for coming up with Damsels in Distress. Ah, okay, um, right. uh, so, but I... I, I liked it. it made I stole me that from more. him, yeah. Um, but so I think it is really important for scientists to communicate their science well um, and part of that is kind of knowing your audience and so you know there might be times when we're at a scientific conference where we can use certain language that we know other scientists will understand but it's we're not really doing our job I don't think as scientists unless we're also sharing with the public what we're doing and so um, you know the public is also you know smart people sure. intelligent you know interested um, but they don't necessarily know some of the scientific jargon that we might use. So it's, right. I think it's important to kind of try and make it accessible to people um, and also, you know, kind of tell them why they should care. Because for someone who in North Carolina might say, well, well I don't care what happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, you right. know, that, what does that have to do with me? Um, but it does have, you know, there is a connection there to yeah. people. And so I think it's our job to really understand our work enough that we can kind of explain it to anyone and and um, share what we're doing with the general public. Yeah, and I think certainly when you speak to your work with shrimp, mahi, white marlin, I think people, their ears perk up anyway, they're interested, they understand the connection. Try working on mud yeah. most of your career. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, um, but I, I do really appreciate the way that you have inter introduced your science to the public, and I, anyway, I, it really made me interested in reading more and so mm -hmm. I think it does make a difference that that idea of the accessibility of the work and so I, I, I was really interested in that. Um, I want to ask a couple questions from the audience. Um, the first, uh, which is interesting, with the full moon coming mm. tomorrow, do the species you have studied behave differently during full moons? That's a really great question. Um, so I don't know about shrimp but I would expect that there is some differences in behavior with them. Um, I know for a fact one of the interesting things, or it was quite interesting to me anyway, um, and, a, and a surprise as well that came out of my work with Mahi Mahi is finding that their, their depth behavior is um, significantly affected by the phase of the moon. So, and most uh, particularly, I guess, at nighttime, although, you know, also during the daytime, which was sort of surprising. Hmm. Um, but with Mahi Mahi, for example, so this is kind of, I guess, one example of how I think it's also, I, I use sort of physiology in an, a lot of my work, even if it's not directly related. Right. Um, so understanding, I guess, some of the vision physiology of Mahi Mahi, that helps me understand that they're not really great at seeing at nighttime. Hmm. Um, but anyone who's fished for mahi mahi knows that they're, you know, voracious. They'll eat just about anything, um, and they are the fastest growing fish in the ocean. And so they have really? to, yeah. Um, actually, so we at the experimental hatchery we had a five pound mahi mahi that we brought in. Nine months later, fifty four pounds. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so they, they, they are extremely good at eating and growing um, and reproducing. And so what's their life cycle? How Most of them do not live past a year, actually. Really? A, a really old mahi-mahi might be three or four, but that's quite rare. Most oh. of them are, are, you know, they have this uh, live fast, die young kind right, of life. Right. Um, so, you know, getting back to the moon phase, um, we know that they want to be eating all the time, but their vision is not real great at nighttime. When there is a full moon, they're a lot shallower in the water column than they are at the new moon. Um, actually, the new moon is probably when I think they're frequently spawning. Um, 
And at the full moon, when they have a little bit more visibility at nighttime, they can kind of take advantage of that. They come up a little bit shallower in the water column than they would otherwise be. And I think that that's, they're probably taking advantage of that additional light, light. to feed. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So, but so what you're studying now, shrimp? I don't know. Don't know. If, but okay. so my, with, you know, the kind of that mahi-mahi data sort of led me to believe that there's probably a lot probably of something. influence that most species, you know, have with, with moonlight. Um, because, it, you know, if it impacts what they can see, they're going to behave differently. And so you've, we've talked about a lot of different species throughout this. Um, is there a favorite that you have and, and why? Favorite species that I've worked with, that's hard because, you know, all, I, I, <laughs> you all, love them all. I do love them all. <laughs> um, I think the most like visually stunning is, is probably a white marlin. Um, that was, you know, that was an exciting part of my career for sure is getting to see those fish in the wild, um, particularly when they're, you know, like on a bait ball or something. So they're circling, you know, smaller. Right bait fish often kind of working together in a group and their colors will flash really dramatically. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool to see. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like it. Something not many people get to see. Yeah. Um, and so you've done a lot of work at sea on boats, um, likely dealt with a lot of maybe some injuries. You're working with a lot of hooks and things like that. All right, so what's the most, I don't know, I don't want to necessarily know the worst injury because I don't know that we want to get into that. <laughs> What's the most interesting, challenging injury? Mm -hmm. um, so way back in college when I was uh, doing that first kind of fisheries experience that got me hooked on this whole career path, I picked up a torpedo ray on the back of the trawl boat um, and got electrocuted. Oh, nice. <laughs> Huh. What's the voltage? Any idea? Uh, I looked it up after, and I can't remember. Oh, okay. I, I know that it was, I could certainly feel it, but I think um, <laughs> he was on his way out, you know, so it wasn't probably as strong as, strong as it would it could have, have been, been, but it was significant. I definitely felt that. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. All right. <clears throat> this may be a trick question, but um, what are some of the challenges with being a postdoc at the postdoc stage of your career? I say it might be a trick question because it's your postdoc advisor asking. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Right. Um, well, it's I would, the advisor is the biggest challenge, right? No, actually. <laughs> um, so I would say that it is it is a great career stage and also challenging. Um, I think part of it is that you know you're sort of trying to set yourself up as an independent researcher while still working, you know, under someone's supervision um, and. Jim has been a great boss and really supporting me in terms of, um, you know, the thing about a postdoc is that it's not really supposed to be permanent, right. which can be hard because, you know, you come somewhere, you move somewhere, yeah. you, you know, you yeah, might it's hard not to. move your, you know, move your pets, your plants, your partner, all, all these right. things, um, relocate, and then you make friends and it's not, it's not forever. Right. So um, that can be a challenge and also just kind of trying to figure out where is your permanent home, which is something that I'm doing now as I try and, you know, find, uh, hopefully, you know, my permanent spot. Well, you've seemed to have landed in some great places. You've done some great things. Um, I have been lucky with locations so yeah. far, and I hope that that continues. And so I guess maybe to wrap it up is maybe advice that you would give to those that would be listening. I mean, you've had a really, I, I say career, right, but you're just sort of blossoming into your career, but you've had this really interesting path, some, done some really exciting things. And I'm curious, yeah, what advice would you give to the budding biologist? Yeah, I mean, so right now I'm doing a lot of coding, which is a great skill. And I know that there's a lot of emphasis on teaching kids to code, which I think is good, but I think it's honestly more important for you know younger students that are maybe interested in science to get out in nature and you know, observe things and see things and just, you know, I don't, that said, I mean, I think there are kids that are going to be like, you know, interested in coding right. and, and that's a great skill and certainly not something that I ever thought I would be good at. Um, but I've, you know, I've learned and I've um, gotten, you know, a lot more confident with it. So right. I think, but I think even, yeah, I would say for younger students, you know, get outside, go fishing, um, you know, get out on the water or hiking, whatever it is that, that makes them happy to kind of just observe things in nature. Um, 
and then for older students getting into college and stuff, uh, I think it's just really helpful to try different experiences. If you know it's not always going to be a perfect fit, um, and certain jobs you might have and say like, well, I really don't want to do this, <laughs> but that's helpful because then you know you can kind of cross that off right. your list. It's, it's good to know what you don't like. Yeah, yeah. and I think there are. Um, a lot of really wonderful scientists out there that are excited to, you know, teach younger students and kind of help them find their path. Um, so kind of finding those, you know, good mentors that will help you and support you and kind of guide you, um, that can be really important. Yeah, that's good advice. And I think you've taken advantage of that throughout your career. Um, and Jim's a wonderful mentor as mm -hmm. well. Um, we appreciate the time that you've spent with us. This has been great. I could continue talking, but they always say I go on too long. <laughs> um, this has been great. I've really enjoyed it, getting to know your science and you as well. And so thank you very much. You're welcome. And we look forward to seeing you in January.